his book, Desiring the Kingdom, James K. A. Smith asks, what if education was primarily concerned with shaping our hopes and passions, our vision of the good life, and not merely about the dissemination of data and information as inputs to our thinking? What if the primary work of education was the transforming of our imagination rather than the saturation of our intellect? And what if this had as much to do with our bodies as with our minds? Charlotte Mason had just such a vision. Earlier in the series, we talked about the desire parents and teachers have to find out which books to use and how to implement Mason's techniques. Hopefully by now you understand that this is just the capstone on a much larger structure. Simply using a particular set of books will not result in achieving the true aims of a Mason education. This model is so much more than a specific curriculum or set of methods. It is a way of viewing children, knowledge, and the highest purpose of education, of moving through the world in a way that allows both students and teachers to flourish as human beings. By focusing first on philosophy, Charlotte Mason keeps pedagogy in its proper place and makes sure that every subject, book, and practice supports that philosophy. So what do we actually do? Well, first we create an atmosphere in which curiosity, exploration, reading, thinking, conversation, beauty, imagination, nature, and ideas are valued. This atmosphere does influence the physical space, but it's more a state of mind to be cultivated in both the teacher and the student. Second, we create habits that allow things like morning routines, organization of supplies, transitions between lessons, etc. to become automated so that we don't lose time and our mental energy can remain focused on the important things. Third, we provide a rich and varied curriculum using the best books we can find on a wide variety of subjects. Fourth, we keep our lessons short enough so that attention does not have time to lag, and we alternate those lessons so that children do not have to sit too long or tax one part of the brain too much. A period of reading might be followed by a few minutes of singing, dancing, or handicrafts, for example. This means we must be mindful of our scheduling and watchful for the first signs of fatigue. And finally, we put children in direct contact with ideas and things, and we support them in deeply processing what they read and observe through narration, the keeping of notebooks, discussion, and very occasionally, direct instruction. Much of the rest is simply getting out of their way and allowing them to come into their own personal knowledge. Mason called this last thing masterly inactivity on the part of the teacher, who is always available to give support when needed, but who also knows how to let children alone to do their own learning. This approach will not result in standardized outcomes that are observable and measurable, but it will result in students who think and care deeply about a wide range of things. Learning will also not necessarily happen in the timeline we have in mind, but you will be astounded that even years after reading a book, children will continue to think about the ideas and make new and deeper connections. As they grow in knowledge, they will also grow in the kind of wisdom that will allow them to listen with open hearts and minds to all kinds of ideas and then discern for themselves which ones they will accept and which ones they will reject. They will have compassion and empathy, and they will have developed the kind of character that leads them to try their best to always do the next right thing. If there is any greater vision for education, I have not encountered it.